Hey everybody, it's Sam with Pro Wrestling Overtime, and I know you haven't heard from me in a while. I've taken the last couple days off to get caught up, to watch the G1 in New Japan, and to bring you all of the excitement. So I want to go back to Friday night in Orlando at WWE's main event, start off talking a little bit about that it opened up with Tamina beating Jasmine Allure. Now, it only took her like five and a half minutes. This was basically an extended squash. But, we know how WWE is, so this was also a tryout. A tryout for the free agent Jasmine Allure. Now, she's only about 5'2". She started wrestling in 2020. But, she has appeared, I think, twice now. Maybe three times. On AEW Dark. And this is her first WWE taped match. We all know that WWE creative does... Things that don't make sense. And I know a lot of you, that's what you gripe about. But you have to understand, they're trying to accomplish different things without direction. They're trying to get Tamina time. They're trying to possibly build her to get people interested in her. But on the other hand, give Jasmine Allure... A tryout. A tryout that maybe she'll get to NXT. With this being in Orlando, Hunter brought some of the NXT producers and agents over. And so that they could watch. Remember, they're getting ready for the last week of July for tryouts in Nashville. And what they're looking for needed to be discussed. And everybody needed to be on the same page. And so, really tried to do that with this particular match. Now, like I said, Tamina got the win. She looked very good doing that. But, this is only Tamina's second win of 2022 and it's July. Tamina um is 2 and 7 on the year and when you look at the nine matches she's had, most of them have been in the mixed tag team area where um T- Tazawa, Akira Tazawa was her partner, usually going up against Reggie and Dana Brooke. So Let's take kind of a a look at Tamina. So, when you talk Tamina, what are you looking at here? She's, I don't know, if I had to guess, she's probably about 5'9", 5'10". She's 44 years old. Tamina started 13 years ago in 2009. And back when she started, um, she also had a brother named James who had tried in the WWE. He went under the name Deuce, or some of you may remember him. He lost a lot of matches as Sim Snooker. Yeah, Sim, like the game, The Sims. She also has two daughters. Now... I'll just be real honest with you. She debuted in the WWE on May 24th, 2010. Most people didn't really pay attention to her until almost her re-debut, maybe? She guest starred a couple times in Total Divas. She was also a guest star on Tough Enough. Then she came out as AJ Lee's bodyguard 
2013, 2014, somewhere around there. And that seemed to get people to take notice. People were intrigued a little bit about Jimmy Snooka's daughter, who was standing behind the petite A.J. Lee and really wanted to know about her being that particular bodyguard. And if you guys remember that storyline, she took care of almost everybody in the women's division. And I think everybody really remembers, or it caught my attention, when A.J. Lee was fighting with Paige, and we saw Tamina stepping up. We saw Tamina uh, eventually taking on Paige. And then, of course, we all know Paige winning the title her first day up, and A.J. Lee kind of almost slipping away. Now, over time, Tamina kind of faded to the background until they decided to form a tag team. And we got, guys, if you're like me, I feel like we all know WWE creates tag teams like crazy. They're all the time throwing women together, creating a tag team. We see them. I don't know, four or five matches for whatever pay-per-view they're leading up to, and then they kind of dissolve, or they turn on each other and become, you know, against each other, enemies. We didn't really see that at first when Tamina was placed with Natty. I don't know about you, I actually enjoyed them as a tag team. It made sense to me. Tamina, like I said, being the daughter of Jimmy Snuka, being the almost older maternal figure with Natty, who we usually see as the older maternal figure, but in this partnership, she took the younger, almost learning background and her being the daughter of Jim Nineheart of the Heart Foundation. Them coming out, wearing gear that matched, doing different tag maneuvers that the Heart Foundation used to do. Tamina in that particular tag team, and I don't know whether it was Natty choreographing it, or T.J. Wilson, or someone else, but their matches seem to really flow together, and they genuinely look like they were having the time of their life being around each other, being together, being tag team champions. And of course, I know you're saying, Sam, everybody enjoys being the tag team champions. Well, I can't blame you there, but... They really did act like they enjoyed it. I wish they would have kept them together, allowed them to lose the cha- the tag team championships, and then continued on. I think there were, were other stories they could have told using their power, their strength, and their connection as a tag team. However, we all know Vince McMahon... He really doesn't care for tag teams. He doesn't see the need. And as they broke up other teams and let go some of the women in the women's division, they needed Natty, they needed Tamina to fill singles roles. However, with that being kind of completed and them not being a tag team, they moved Natty on to form other tag teams. Tamina almost got lost in the shuffle. And because she's a quiet, um, easygoing person, 
and not one to make waves and demand being in the forefront of the women's division, they have relegated her over to the 24-7 title, and you're, you're constantly seeing her in the chase for that. Now, she is the four-time women's, um, I shouldn't say women's, 24-7 champion. We did see her in a short comedic presentation story, two minutes uh, of an episode when it was Reggie and Dana against her and Akira Tozawa leading to the double wedding, leading to the divorce. I really wish they would do something again and give Tamina other things to do. And, I mean, I know some of you don't pay attention to her, or you only pay attention to her because... She's in the news because The Rock gave her a new car, or gave her a new house with her being his cousin, and and helping her out. I think everybody knows that she's part of the Samoan dynasty. I just think that she sometimes gets shortchanged when she could be used for other things. Now, that's kind of my, just my snapshot of what's going on with Tamina. Now, the last match of main event was Mustafa Ali with Cedric Alexander beating up on Akira Tozawa. Imagine that. Took him like seven minutes. Now, in order to tell Mustafa Ali and Cedric's story, I think we have to go back to the 4th of July. Yeah, all the way two weeks ago. Remember, they were on Raw at the 4th of July cookout together. And they were having issues with Veer? Yeah, remember, they took his hot dog? Remember... I was like, what? What are you talking about? They start talking on commentary. They're now a tag team? Really? When? Have you ever seen them be a tag team? Because I sure haven't. And then Kevin Patrick starts talking about how they're best friends. And they're the pranksters of WWE. Number one, I don't call stealing someone's hot dog a prank. But number two, we've never seen this. It's like, imagine, they're creating some kind of friendship from them. So last week, on main event, you saw Mustafa Ali actually pass out from Veer getting him back, Veer submitted him, and Akira Tozawa got defeated pretty handedly by T-Bar. So it makes sense this week. We kind of get the two losers of the match. So you see Ali and Cedric Alexander come out. Mustafa Ali is still in his old gear, but we see Cedric in a pair of red denim overalls with the strap undone. Now, I don't know about you. I'm from the South. I see overalls all the time. Usually not red denim ones, but, you know. This was a creative comedy match, and I enjoyed it. For the simple fact, I got to see a different side of Mustafa Ali. Did I get to see his normal, athletic, flippy side? Yes, definitely. I already knew about that. I think everyone in WWE knows he can do athletic parts, but he has to show a personality, a passion, a conviction, 
when they give him moments. And I just don't feel like he does. I don't feel like he captures people's attention. Now, Akira, he's absolutely wonderful at this comedy wrestling. He even hit under the ring and tried to pop out, sneak up on Ali, which when you have Cedric Alexander out there is a little hard to do, and he was met with a super kick to the face for it. Later, uh, you got to see Ali get out of an octopus. An octopus stretch that I didn't know Akira Tozawa could do. But he looked excellent doing it. Then we saw Mustafa do a sit-down powerbomb where he got the two, and I thought we were done with this. But we wanted to see some more flippy stuff. So we got to see Ali do the 450 splash and get the victory. Was this worth your time watching? Um, no. No, not really. Um, if you like Ali and you want to see the athletic and see maybe a different side of him, that's fine. They're going to end up showcasing them on Raw or SmackDown in the future, and people are going to have the same reaction I did to Ali and Cedric Alexander. What? When did they become a tag team? And that's kind of what you're left with. And they taped this after Friday Night Smackdown. Friday Night Smackdown uh, ratings were two point zero, or excuse me, two million and uh, seventy seven thousand. This was down two point four percent from last week. So what does that mean? Well, last week they had more people. That's the breakdown. People want to say, what does it mean? You're watching the rise and fall. Like the 18 to 49 demographic. It was 0.47 last week. It's 0.47 this week. Well, what does that mean? It means the same people were watching. I think a lot of time people see these numbers and... They want to pay attention to them because they see them so often. They just don't really understand them. Guys, pay attention to the rise and fall. And pay attention when they say they're up for the month or up for the quarter or up for the year. Because that's what networks basically look for. If you're seeing that... SmackDown is down for the year, then you may want to think, is Fox going to renew? And I know some of you are like, well, why do I care how much money WWE is making on the Fox deal? You shouldn't. But what you should care about is, is Fox going to get it back? Because if they don't, it goes to a new station, you're going to have to have that station. And if it's a station you don't get, are you going to have to pay for it, and how is it going to cost you? You know, that's what people are not recognizing when they hear, oh, AEW may go to streaming. Well, if they do, who are they going to go to? Well, they may go with their Warner Brothers uh, media, Uh, components that they already have. If they do that, will they be on HBO Max? Well, how does that affect me? I don't have HBO Max. I would have to get that. Going to cost me $14.99 a month. Am I going to get enough viewing from AEW and HBO that I'm going to enjoy? And is it going to be $15 worth? That's what the ratings mean to you. It's, are they going to stay? Is Raw going to stay on the USA Network? Or is it going to be moved? Is Fox going to, you know, partner with them and basically rent them for a couple years, and now it's going to be on FS1? 
do I have at this one? That's how ratings affect you. Now, the other thing that I want to talk about in this episode, and I kind of throw it in here, and you're like, it's not WWE. Well, no, but Ricky Steamboat was part of the WWE, and a lot of people do remember Ricky Steamboat, because a lot of people back in the late 80s, early 90s, were also watching NWA, they were getting ready for for WCW, and like I said, Ricky Steamboat was part of the WWF, and they have kind of started bringing him back. Ricky Steamboat has kind of been out of our minds, out of our notice of things for quite a while. And I don't know if you have been paying attention over, I would say, the last six to eight months. He has been on and off a part of the NWA. If you guys get to watch NWA Power or NWA USA, I encourage you guys to watch them. They have some nice young stars, and they have some talented veterans that come through and work with them. No, no, I'm not talking Ricky Steamboat as a talented veteran. I'm I'm talking people like Trevor Murdoch, Matt Cardona, Nick Aldis, uh, Tom Latimer. You're seeing young guys work with them, and you're like, young guys? I haven't seen any young guys. Yes, you have. Ricky Starks being one of them. He was the NWA champion probably two, two and a half years ago. It's a show that's on YouTube for free that you guys can catch on Saturdays. Anyway, back to Ricky Steamboat. Ricky Steamboat, uh, like I said, has appeared a couple different times. He's also appeared on MLW. They're running kind of a meet and greet around NWA 74. Now, NWA 74 is taking place in St. Louis, uh, the 27th and 28th. Then they are moving and going to tape NWA Power in Nashville. So they're doing kind of this whole weekend thing. It's four days. Two in St. Louis, two in Nashville. They're doing some meet and greets, and that's where you can see Ricky Steamboat. He's doing a meet and greet in Nashville on August 29th. Now, if you buy a ticket to Ricky Steamboat, you get access to the NWA Power and to the NWA USA tapings that they'll be doing in Nashville, Tennessee. So not only do you get to meet Ricky Steamboat, you get to go see NWA Power. Guys, go get the autograph of Camille, uh, their NWA World Champion, uh, Mickey James. It, like I said, Nick Aldis is the one that you definitely want. Now, if you buy a VIP ticket, you not only get to meet Ricky Steamboat, you get a photo, an autograph. You're going to get to go to a Q&A session with Billy Corgan, who is the owner of NWA. He's going to tell you where he is taking them in the future. There are rumors out there that they're going to start streaming NWA, possibly on Fight TV, possibly on Bleacher Report. And then you're going to get early access to go in to NWA Power and NWA USA. So, just kind of wanted to throw it out there. I think we all remember the the 1989 battle with Flair for the NWA Championship. Um, Guys, we all know his battle, uh, what was it, WrestleMania 3? 4? 3. I think his battle with Ric Flair in WrestleMania. So, Guys, I just wanted to kind of throw that out here. Now, this is the kind of episode that you can expect. I'm going to do a kind of weekend news and rumors, uh, some rumors on Roman Reigns, going to talk a little bit about those, 
And you're going to kind of get a breakdown like this about Raw. So give me a uh, hit, I guess, on whether you like this new format, this new kind of breakdown and analysis, bits and pieces of different things. Guys, I am pro overtime that's two o's pro overtime on twitter you can follow me on instagram at pro wrestling overtime you can write to me at press pro wrestling ot at gmail.com pro wrestling ot at gmail.com and of course on facebook i'm pro wrestling overtime i look forward to hearing from you guys and i'll talk to you soon and hopefully i'll see you down the road